All right, Big Mag, today is Tuesday. It is September 7th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports. You know who I'm here with. How it's me. You? I'm good. How are you? Good. Doing well. We are... Week one's in the books. Week one's in the books. College football. College Notre football. Notre Dame's 1-0 right now. Possibly. We're, We're recording record- this on a Friday before. Hey, Eddie, Notre yeah. Dame's 1-0. They're 1-0. Yeah, are you sure, pal? Because you're gonna have this out out there. Notre Dame is gonna run the ball down Florida State's throat, and they're gonna be better than people are giving them credit for. They're one and zero. They're one and zero, and they blew them out. You're setting yourself up for two bad looks in a row. What's the other one? Uh, Thursday, Thursday's draft. Uh, you have a tough moment tough breaking moment <laughs> so you could happen to anyone you're having a you're gonna have a tough week if no I, i'm okay with that look at i'm okay with uh my <laughs> reaction to some potential news it's it, yeah it's not the best look i didn't read carefully but that happens sometimes yeah so what are you gonna do we are doing the classic history tinfoil tuesday type deal today yeah kind of a throwback kind of also like a what they do what did they do? Yeah, yeah correct. We, yeah. yeah, I've done one we, of those in a while. Yeah, we've kind of gotten away from those. Mm-hmm. And it's also kind of piggybacking off of last week's episode. A lot, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I'm excited to get into it. Before we do, though, Chief, you know we got to talk about Upstart. I love Upstart. Upstart, you know, I mean, paying off debt sucks. Mm-hmm. That's no secret. Everybody hates that. Everybody hates it. Yep. And it's hard. Has, yeah, it is hard. Everyone mm-hmm. has different methods. Um, I mean, it could just be daunting being in a spot where it's like, I need this loan to go through, and they're only going to look at this, and I know yep. what the answer is going to be. So um, that's why Upstart's here for you, because they want you to be smarter. It's a fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan that's all done online. You guys know, like I've been saying, it's not just a credit score. They look at other things. Mm-hmm. So that's big. So with a five-minute online rate check, you can see your rate up front. For loans between $1,000 to $50,000, you can receive the funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. So find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash Eddie. That's Eddie, E-D-D-I-E. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit income and certain other information provided in your loan application. It's important. No, yeah. It's important. Got to have it. And, you know, I'm looking to get a house, I think, next year. And it's one of those things where, you know, if you have different credit cards you have to pay off and it's this date, it's that date, you can just kind of consolidate it all into one place, mm-hmm. make it simple, make it easy. Upstart's the way to do all that. Yep, start being smarter. Be smart. All right, Howard Hughes. So, full disclosure, before we get into anything, I know we said I knew he was the aviator guy. Mm -hmm. I don't really remember the aviator. I was in seventh grade. Good. And that was a movie where I'm like, I I was disinterested very fast. Yep. Not one of Leo's best, in my opinion, which I I think people would agree. I would agree, and it's too bad because he's a a crazy character this yeah. life this howard hughes and and leo you would think would be the guy to uh to do him he actually is kind of flopped on um but i would say biopics in uh general you think so yeah well, the, the revenant was that's what he won his oscar on yeah but that wasn't really a true story at all really like really not at all if you go like as i went through i'm a fucking nerd but i go through like um, phases <laughs> where I just like oh like I'm gonna like just read all about like this one particular part of history and I did like a uh, the frontier which is like one of my favorites and when you read that story about what actually happened it's like it is like almost every single detail in that movie is wrong really yeah that's it, it's a, it's pure fiction it's, but I mean, there it's still is a an guy awesome who, who traveled a long way after getting attacked yep. by a bear correct yep. and they used a lot of the the name the prominent names from that from that era it's just it's just that story it's like an amalgamation of like a few different people and like that whole thing with the sun just not true and and uh the whole like the landscape the part of the country that that uh, you know they would make it like this dense rainforest and the snow like that's not true and so it's like um you know it's it's one of those things wildly entertaining it's not and i i wouldn't count that as a uh, bio i was thinking j edgar hoover yeah was like another leo uh, one of like a fascinating guy that flopped in yeah. my opinion. So I don't know if it, if it did well at the box office or not, but I didn't think it was a good movie. One note too. Sorry. I know this is not a fucking Leo critique mo- hour, but at the same time, I feel like we're here. So why mm-hmm. not do it? I don't know why so many people dismiss the reverend, the revenant. Though. I thought it was good that I think people 
think of it as I thought it was very good too, but it was almost like a lifetime achievement award type thing where it's like, you know, he got passed over. Like he wasn't even nominated for Titanic. Yeah, he people was, were so caught up and like, well, he won one, but that wasn't his best role. So I'm going to shit on this movie. It's crazy. I didn't like that. I didn't like that either. I don't like that at all. So I thought the, it was really good. That opening scene, that fight scene was insane. F- oh, yeah. That insane. W- insane. Great. I think it's a very good movie. I don't. Yeah. Know, I don't know why. I don't. I, I agree that I understand what people are saying. Like it wasn't his best role, which is true. I actually think maybe his best role was Django. Uh, he was sick in that. He was great in Django, and it wasn't even a huge part. Yeah, he would have been like best supporting actor. We yeah. didn't get one for that either. That's you know that scene where he like smashes his hand on the table. And he's it was bleeding? real. Yeah, it was real. Yeah, I love mm-hmm. that. But anyways, look at this, folks. Talking movies that I've seen. Yeah, motherfuckers. He's seen a few. <laughs> he's seen a few. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sorry. And the Aviator, like it's a, in full disclosure, I've seen the Aviator. It's been on HBO a lot lately. Like Aviator, the Aviator. I'm gonna yeah. have to rewatch it. I probably will rewatch it after this. Yeah, um, but it's one of those things where it's like I never watch it the full way through. So it's like I I pick it up, scene here, scene there, fifteen minutes here, yeah. go back to the game I'm watching, pick it up. So like I've never seen the full way through either. Okay, and I, I mean at this point that was a pretty early movie for him. Oh six. Oh four. Oh four. Okay. So yeah, I mean, yeah, he was. But whatever, All right. whatever. Yeah, it's not we're here for Howard about. Hughes, not Leonardo DiCaprio, right? And not even his version of Howard Hughes, yeah, exactly. Right. So who was this fucking guy? So it's a fucking mystery, is what it turns out to be. I'm like, there's so many like, there's so many things about him because he was he was like the first real, like public eccentric celebrity billionaire in a way, and uh, because he. If you talk about like the some of the guys we've talked about before, the Rockefellers, the you know all the people from that previous generation, Vanderbilt, et cetera, like the media was not this robust thing because radio hadn't been invented yet, uh, TV wasn't invented yet, and so it was basically relied on the newspaper. So you didn't really have this. Uh, Elon Musk factor where like he smokes weed on Rogan and the world goes crazy. Right. So Mm -hmm. Howard Hughes was kind of the first guy to use the media to kind of build up his own brand brand and um but there's so many details like i'm talking down to his birth were changed okay really so he would always say like yep i was born on i was born on christmas eve and that was like part of his narrative he's like i was born uh, i was like i had triplets but i was the only one that survived and turns out that's not true he wasn't even born on christmas eve he wasn't born as triplets he was born and he said he was born in houston wasn't born in houston they found his birth certificate in some old dusty file after he died um that was like going back to his baptism so he got baptized on uh, like october 7th of that year so when he wasn't even supposed to be born yet and they found a birth certificate that said he was born on september 24th so it's like I don't like this. That's kind of kind of crazy, right? Unless he had a reason to be hiding stuff because of something another. I life, think but. it was more like I Jesus was born this day. I was also born. Like that's what oh. it, that's what it seems like. He changed his. Well, day. He's like a Kanye fucking. Guy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He had a lot of that to him, and he and then <laughs> he his father. If you like read into the history of his parents, it's like he is the perfect combination of his parents because. His dad was a little bit of a shyster um, type guy, but then like turned legit and made a fuck ton of money. And his mom had like all sorts of like mental uh, health issues, we'll mm-hmm. say. But and so did Howard at the end. But his dad was like this guy who got like basically was like a con artist, and he was like running around like fucking all these girls in in Missouri, and basically like got run out of Missouri. Ended up in Texas and happened to, he was like, I'm going to try to be an oil guy. So, like, one of, like, his first days on the job, he was at this site where they have legitimately, they said it was, like, almost, like, a thousand foot geyser of oil spray out of the ground. Like, you see those classic scenes where they talk, like, yeah. black gold and Texas mm-hmm. tea and all those things. Like, they struck it rich. And he wasn't really a part of it, but his name got attached to it. So, then he would buy up all these, like, land grants and, the, and these... um he would buy, you know, these different sites that he would just get these grants to do more drilling and he would take it. And then because of the people in the industry and the people around Texas knew his name, like, Ooh, how, you know, he was actually Howard. He was, you know, senior Ooh, he bought up this plot and then he would turn around, he would buy it. He'd get this plot of land and then sell it for a profit like days later. 
Like literally, like he would buy it on Wednesday. Oh, because people knew what he was finding. Yeah, so they around this. So they're like, they, he was just like kind of capitalizing. There's no like real oil rights there necessarily, yeah. but he would just be, oh, Howard Hughes bought it. Well, he has, he wants out on this piece of land, but he thinks it's rich, so he would buy it on you know like on a Wednesday and sell it on a Friday and turn a profit, and that happened quite a bit over a period of months that he amassed like a small fortune and moved to Houston. But there was credence behind it, though, or was this kind of like people? not really, no, okay. not really. Okay, like the land was real, but there's no and like the the rights to the oil, if it was underneath the land, was real. But he was just kind of using like the momentum of the times, yeah, to get in at a cheap price that he would get from the government and then flip it to prospectors. And he did like smart, but not really much to it. He gets to to Houston and sets up his own company, still like in the oil game, and he's like really like frustrated with um you know like the the drill bits that are out there he's just like these things fucking suck i'm gonna make my own and he makes his own and it's like a revelation this new type of dr- drill bit that they have like now they're like some of the richest people in the in, in america like howard hughes's dad because he invented this new type of drill bit that allowed them to go deeper faster they lasted longer it was like the the drill bit in like the the best one in the world. So I'm sure that makes me think there's probably a little bit of schmoozing with the land going on. I assume, right? Yeah. They have people who's like, hey, like I bought this land, and also, hey, I'm working on this drill bit. I don't know. So the drill bit actually came after. So he did the land thing, and he he had this money, and he started this other oil company, and he and he. But he wasn't working on it at the same time. Like, no, it was kind of like a whole separate right. thing. Oh, okay. Like he used okay. the money from the land that that he was a- able to make some money, and then he developed like a legitimately awesome drill bit that changed the world and, and changed the, like the oil and gas industry in Texas and, and elsewhere forever. And it was like a huge, huge business. Yeah. So he was like doing shady kind of like, ah, eh, kind of stuff like using the name, using, you know, being like a, like a sleazy salesman kind of thing. And they got the money and then like turned legit because he invented this awesome drill bit. Mm. And like, they're, they're big, right? Like these drill bits are, they're not like a, little, a monster, like, screwdriver. Yeah. It's like a thing that, you know, it would fit in the room but you know barely okay yeah. so it was like a, it was like a big big deal yeah. and uh and they made a shit ton of money then well the, well can i say this too mm-hmm. speaking of drilling okay if you're going to be doing some drilling <laughs> oh, in the wow. future what a pro you got to get some roman swipes <laughs> Drilling as long we talk about long lasting. This drill bit, this is this is the Howard Hughes drill bit of swipe on products. Absolutely. Just lasts forever. Most guys have tried different ways mm-hmm. less are in bed. I bet your ass Howard Hughes Senior wishes he could swipe on those those drill bits. That we'll get into Howard longer. Hughes Junior, which needed it badly too. Oh, okay. Big time. All right. So yeah, yeah he wishes, you know, yep. I'm sure those things could have lasted a little longer. Um because Roman swipes, folks, they're clinically proven as a way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and they're fast acting, but they don't require a prescription. Roman can ship to you, and they can ship the swipes to you in discreet, unmarked packaging. And each swipe packet is small enough to hide in your wallet for whenever you need it. They're super easy to use. Just take the swipe out of the packet, swipe it on, let it dry, and you're good to go. That's it. Go to getroman.com/walk, and you can get your first month of swipes for just five dollars when you choose a monthly plan. That's getroman.com/walk. Go do it. Because Howard Hughes Senior sure wish he did. So you have the opportunity, so you should do it. Mm-hmm. All right. So fast forward. Now they have like ungodly money, right? And <laughs> Howard Hughes is going to different boarding schools, this and that, as as a, like a youth. Like I'm talking like first, second, third grade. Like his dad's not really around him that much, and he goes to these schools, and he only really has a relationship with his mother, so he only like plays and sits with the girls. So Howard Hughes' dad, Howard Hughes Sr., he like hears that his, like his son is regarded as like a sissy, and he's like, "Wow, we got to get him out of there." And his dad takes a more active role in his life, trying to shape him. You'll, I think, you'll like this story. Okay, <laughs> so you talk about him, the aviator. Like, how does he go? How does a, a guy from an oil comp, an oil family, become this aviation guy? When he was ten. He and his dad went to Connecticut to watch a uh, crew race, like, you know, like the rowing, like the Winklevoss mm-hmm. twins. And it was Harvard versus Yale. And his dad was like, all right, like, who do you think is going to win? And he goes, and they like made a bet, a $5 bet saying, and Howard Hughes Jr. at 10 years old picks Harvard. Harvard wins. His dad gives him the money. Okay. Wow. He goes over. They're walking along this river that they had the race on, and he sees this a boat plane. 
like a early, early like Wright Brothers era like bi wing plane that was a boat. Okay, so you could buy a, a ticket on the plane for five dollars. You go up for ten minutes on this new technology. You know, we're talking this is like the nineteen teens, right? So planes have yeah. just been invented, and he spends his five dollars that he won gambling against his dad for a ticket and they go up they go up together with the pilot and Howard Hughes senior like pukes his guts out Howard Hughes junior is like this is the uh, the coolest thing in the world and like so from that moment on he's like obsessed with aviation okay and so he goes you know does all the the right things goes to school goes to college his mother gets pregnant uh and dies during the pre- of like complications in the pregnancy in 1922 his dad dies in two years later, 1924. So now Howard Hughes is the sole heir to this giant fortune from the oil business. The only problem is he doesn't give a fuck about oil. Okay, so he takes that money and he basically like sell, sells off like the controlling interest or like a large part for huge, you know, good amount of money. And after he like had to negotiate these things to take control, he brings in other people. He has this. Yeah, you know, like I said, a pile of money to, per- and he pursues the two things that he loves most, kind of three things. One is um, aviation, so he starts like an aerospace company, and he was also like a huge movie producer. Mm. And I can't remember if that's featured in the movies in the in the Aviator movie or not. But he's like he's like an early like this is now we're into like the 1930s. He's a big big Hollywood producer. He lives out there, lives in Beverly Hills, and he actually won an Oscar as a producer. So he was like a legit guy. It wasn't just like uh, like some douchebag from Entourage. Well, I got money, you know, like the show yeah, Entourage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got money. Like, let's just try to make this happen. And then he he's like one of the people who is credited with like changing the way that movies are produced and run because he create he made this like kind of fictional Al Capone story, and he made it like profanity and some nudity and violence, and it was like a cutting edge thing. And they sent it out. And the government came back and we're like, well, you can't, this is not suitable for the public consumption. Like this is a crazy movie with all this shit in there that had never been done before. And he's like, fuck you. First amendment, freedom of speech. Like this is, this is my right. And he went to court and he won. So he, he had like a bunch of flops after that, but he's regarded as a guy who kind of like changed the way Hollywood and movies and really art work forever because he challenged, he was the first guy to really challenge the government and that was in the mm. 30s. Yeah, so, I'm sure the rating system and everything came after that, right? I think well after that. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think there was a rating yeah, system well, before yeah, that. And that probably forced him into yeah, it, I assume. Yeah, right. So, but he was like uh, he was always like a guy pushing the envelope no matter what he was involved in. So, I said the three things were aviation, movies, and then women. Those were like his three things. So, he went out to Hollywood officially in like 1929. He was married. He was just fucking every starlet all of them all of them okay and to the point like his wife filed for divorce he's like fine scram do you remember have you seen shawshank redemption ed please say yes of course okay you know the you know the first poster uh that covers the hole in the wall you remember the name oh yes yes when he escapes rita Rita hayworth okay Okay. she was the she was the first like he that um he went through like several different women on those posters the first poster he had was rita hayworth that was one of howard hughes's girls okay um Catherine Hepburn, another like gorgeous, you know, a lister at the time. Same thing. Like, and, and like, if you, if you like look at all the women that he was tied to from that era, you're like, holy shit. Mm-hmm. And now the, it, it's not like names that we would re- necessarily recognize because there's other than Rita Hayworth, because I think because of Shawshank, but he was, it was like a who's who. So it's like you would talk about DiCaprio with he's just been he linked was, to like everyone. Howard Hughes was like that. That's probably why Leo wanted to do it. Yeah, he's like, yeah, I'll cast everybody myself. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just go through my own Rolodex. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, he had like crazy, crazy um, amounts of women, amounts of money, and he had like two wildly different companies with his his aviation and the Hollywood thing. And then he had still had so much money from the oil that he ends up buying TWA. Okay, and he also. Um, became a, a licensed pilot himself to the point that um, he, when they were coming up with these new airplanes and stuff, he was always the guy. He was always the test pilot. And that he tried, again, like a thing to like enhance his brand, enhance his company's brand. He 
created the uh, the world's fastest plane. So he was like legit, like as an engineer. That was something like in school too. Like he was known as like a math and 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 engineering like whiz. And uh, so he would design these planes and have his team of engineers, and then he would fly them. So he had the fastest plane I think ever recorded at that time. He was going like three hundred sixty five miles an hour, which is you know crazy yeah. fucking fast. You know mm-hmm. this is nineteen thirties. And then he did the uh, the fastest uh, circumvention of the globe. So he did he did the entire planet Earth from New York, you know, New York, Paris, Russia, place in Moscow, I think Hawaii, San Francisco, and then back home three days. So he did uh, three days and change. So he was like a, a people like and he was so he became a celebrity. Like we talk about um, who was the guy who got his baby stolen. Uh, uh, Lindbergh. Yeah, so like that, like when if you're like a kind of a Daredevil or Amelia Earhart, like the pilots at that time were doing like the transatlantic flights or the the flights around the world, were very famous. He was a guy who had crazy money, designed the planes, flew the planes, and then came back home to the ticker tape. And it was a little bit off putting for him personally because he was such like, uh, like kind of a crazy person and like a recluse and like kind of shy and didn't like the attention, but also wanted like the glory. So he had like this push and pull like in his own head about, I want to be like the, the world's greatest and I want attention, but not too much. Mm-hmm. So like he, he always like really, really struggled with that. It was not something that he, he did naturally. And uh, we'll get into part two here, but before we do, you know, we got to talk about upstart here. Uh, Howard Hughes. I mean, he may not have needed to may have, you know, he needed a simpler life, and yeah. Upstart is good at providing that. Exactly. So uh, if you're in a situation where you're having trouble paying off debt, make sure you look into Upstart. Okay, mm-hmm. It's a fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan that's all done online. And, uh, you know, it's I know it could feel like a mountain and you're just digging and digging and digging where you can't make a dent where you can't make a dent. Um, That's why Upstart's here to help you because they don't just look at your credit score. They know you're more than that. They want to expand everything and kind of dig into more and, you know, give you a fair shake at actually paying off some of this debt. So go do that five minute online rate check. You can see your rate up front for loans between one thousand to fifty thousand dollars and you can receive the funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. So find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash Eddie. That's upstart.com slash Eddie, E-D-D-I-E. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. All right, let's hop into part two. And then, so now, like, he's one of the, the leaders in the world for aviation, and that's when he starts to get connected with the government. So now it's it's World War II. It's coming around and he gets these like pretty big government contracts to deliver all sorts of different planes. He came up with a, like a, a flying transport plane uh, that was enormous because our ships were sailing across the Atlantic filled with troops and the German U-boats, the submarines, were sinking them. So the government's like, how the fuck? Like we got to come up with a way to like have our troops be able to be sailing across and they get to a trouble area, take off in the air. Howard Hughes they put him in charge of that. So he he had these different um, designs and boats and government contracts into the 40s. And then this is something that the movie um, really highlights is like he had Alan Alda, I think, was the, the congressman in the movie where he was like uh, the adversary to Howard Hughes. And they, they brought him up before Congress for a hearing. And I think it was 46, so after the war, because he didn't deliver on all these government contracts because he was, like, an OCD guy. Like, he would really, like, be constantly, like, washing his hands and, like, and you know, one of those types and always tinkering with his designs and it's not good enough, I'm going to fix it. They even said, like, he was so OCD that one of the reasons for his haircut, which is, like, kind of a style of the time, but his was, like, perfect, he had, like, a center part. Because he just wanted everything, even down to his hair, to just be like whoosh, perfectly symmetrical on either side. Because that's just how nuts he was about like OCD type stuff. And um, damn, he's pretty fascinating. I'll be honest. He I'm is. Like, he uh, is. Whoa. Yeah. And um, so, so then that's when he he gets he he gets these government contracts, and that's like his first link to the government. And he's got some people who are, are adversaries, and he's got a lot of people who are who are with him. And that's what we talked about some of the Bobby Kennedy stuff. So, but at the same time, he is like losing his mind. And like I said, he was the test pilot for all of his planes. Well, 
that's actually very dangerous, right? Fuck the, yeah. Okay, so you have these, you build these planes in a hangar, you tinker with them, you do this, you start the engines, you do that. There's only one way to know if they work, and that's to fly them, okay? So he would be the first guy to fly them. He was in five different plane crashes and survived all of them. Oh, my Okay. What? Yes. Okay. So now you we think plane crashes today. It's like how the fuck does anyone survive a plane crash? Yeah. Dude. Well, back then planes were, were flying slower. They're flying lower to the ground. So it was more. You were more likely to gliding serve. kind of thing, and he was able just to yeah, and and, and at lower altitudes. Yeah. So it's not like you're crashing from you know thirty thousand feet when you're going at you know near speed sound you know it's yeah, not yeah, the, yeah. it's not quite the same and it's not jet fuel it was diesel fuel you know so there's mm -hmm. there are some different factors but yeah like he was still not great to be in and but he was in a car crash too but he his fifth uh plane crash like kind of fucked him up so he had a bad gash on top of his head he had suffered burns and then he uh fractured his neck and like those things never really went away okay so the pain from that last plane crash never really went away he started taking a mix of codeine valium and another thing i can't remember what it was he added morphine later in life but he was after that plane crash he was taking valium and codeine like heavy doses every single day for th the next 30 years of his life Good Lord. okay so he he starts to like lose it mentally because he was already kind of predisposed to that. He had had some head trauma from these plane crashes, and then he was doubling down with all the drug use um, to to control the pain. And some of the you know the, so the test pilot caused him two issues where the government was like mad at him. Okay, so there's speculation that it was like, hey, like you're in trouble with Congress because you didn't deliver on some of these giant government contracts you had these floating aircrafts and you know this this and that why don't you work with us on this why don't you work with us on that okay so that that is speculation that that's how he got into uh into more cahoots with the cia during the cold war and that led up to some of these things where he's implicated with the kennedys uh both assassinations because he was the, he had the money, he had the name, he had no like direct connection to the CIA, but he also what's another thing back in the back in the day in the 30s and the 40s, if you're a big movie guy, you've seen The Godfather, who was really involved in the unions and links to different stars, things like that, it's the mafia. Yep. Okay. So um as time goes on, he, like I said, he had to testify before Congress in 1947, and he gives this like unbelievable, charismatic, um, kind of defiant response in his congressional hearing, and it comes off amazing. Okay, like he's like people are like, oh my god, like Howard Hughes, like just bitch slapped like these guys from Congress, like he's fine and he's doing great. That's the last time he was ever really seen publicly, because after that, like he just kind of like starts lost to, it to lose it allegedly unless he's you know something else is something going else on. is going on but um but like the the accounts of like his mental health falling apart get insane so he was driving around california with his like team and this is in uh like 1958 now okay or fast forward to 58 and there, he's like hey i want to screen this movie like pull over at this at this production facility because he was still in the movie business they, they bring him over there he doesn't leave for four months. He just sits in the dark, naked, watching movies, eating, literally eating, like su surviving on chocolate bars and milk, just round the clock. People would be like, "Hey, four months, four months, okay? Hey, Howard," and then he would write on a legal pad, "Don't look at me and don't speak to me unless you're spoken to," okay? So, th and these were like his closest aides. So they're like, "We don't know what to do. This is like one of the richest people in America." Uh, the, he, how would he ask for more chocolate bars? I think he might have just had a stash. Like, I don't know, or like, he, or he, have fucking... or he writes it on a on a legal pad and like gives it. Like, hey, go get me more Hershey's. Yeah. You know, like it, it, that's what he was doing. Like he was what like the fuck, dude? insane. He's going insane. Okay, so that was like another like com. Like I said before, like he had the head trauma, the drug use. He was already predisposed. His mother had documented mental health problems, and. Now he's like doing this thing where he's sitting in a, in a, you know, in a, in a place for four months. It's not even like built for that. So he had like a, a recording, like a, like a reclining chair 
and like a cot and he was just in this dark room for four months watching movies okay insane so he finally pulls himself out of that and this is when he adds like the morphine to the mix okay so now he's on morphine codeine and valium every single day and uh in 1966 he sells uh basically all of his interests in the aviation company to i think it was to general motors uh and his other businesses too um and that those sales of his companies did make him the, the like categorically the richest man in america so he is like in 1966 it's like you see the list in forbes and stuff like oh it's bezos it's this guy it's that guy no it was howard hughes in 66 like by far okay so then he's like he's living in california and he's um traveling around he has homes in like boston i want to say and other places and um but he he ends up in Las Vegas and he's staying at if again if you watch The Godfather, The Godfather 2, they show uh the Desert Inn. They have a couple scenes of the Desert Inn, which is like the first like real kind of high roller mafia owned place in Vegas. And he was uh living in a suite, same thing. Like, oh, let's stop by this and you do this at the Beverly Hills Hotel too. Oh, let's stop by the Beverly Hills Hotel. Doesn't leave. Like just puts up shop there for like a year. He was in the Beverly Hotel for a year. Then uh, they finally leave that, and he goes, and he settles in Vegas. He's like, I really believe in what they're building here in Vegas. So he's like, set, he's running like his empire out of the suite on the the penthouse suite, which is eight stories back then of the Desert Inn. And they're like, Hey, man, like you gotta go. Like he, they tried to, they were trying to get him to leave. So what was his answer to that? He, no, no, and I'll just buy the whole hotel. <laughs> so he did. Because he's the richest man in America, just bought, gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. He bought the whole desert in and lived. He, so then he turned the whole top floor, eighth floor, into like his headquarters. So he lived there. He had offices there, and he was just running shop out of the desert in. He also, I would say, in a way, invented Netflix. Okay, he bought a TV station, a local TV station, in Las Vegas. And the sole purpose of him buying that TV station was so he could just tell him what movies to play. So he had a station that he bought <laughs> that all they did was play movies that he wanted to watch. You call up, hey, put on this. Hey, put on that. Hey, put on, you know, whatever movie from the time that he wanted to watch. So it was just on. He invented on-demand viewing uh, for himself just because. So he just, just by buying a local TV station. Jeez, and same dude. thing. Like he would sit in the dark. And like just watch movies and like have these weird communications and he was on drugs and he he eventually like they say he married this woman and so like she became and I think they ended up divorcing but he married her and the, the some of the speculation is that he married her because he was fearful that his top aides were going to have him committed like to a mental institution. He's like, I can't have that. So I got to have some intermediary, my wife, who would have like the right to be like, no, you can't put him in so that and that's why he married her. I'm reading here too that, uh, that he would sit there naked in the bedroom, yeah, with a pink hotel napkin placed over his balls to watch <laughs> the movie, and he did that because he found the touch of clothing painful due to his due to his burns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he right, like this is what I mean. Like, so he, this is like where it's like, whoa, this guy's crazy. To like, whoa, he's like actually. Yeah, well, he's in a lot of pain. Oh, yeah, there's, yeah. A lot of, there's a lot of issues. Yeah, but. there's a lot of issues, and some are real, and some are probably like he's just like, I'm the richest guy in the world, and I'll just like it, like didn't like that four month period is like he let his hair grow crazy, he didn't shower, he didn't see anybody, he didn't talk to anybody, and he was just like he's just a recluse in in this movie screening area. Damn. All right, let's take one more break here, and let's talk about Roman Chief, the swipes, the swipes, and we we alluded to it yesterday, Howard Hughes. Big swinging dick. I'm sure he had all <laughs> sorts of methods, counting sheep, baseball stuff, anything you could do to last longer. Because this is this is ancient times, so he didn't have the benefits yeah. of a clinically approved Roman swipe to keep his dick hard, so he can just keep on drilling. Yeah. So why don't you use the tools that are available to you that Howard didn't have? Mm -hmm. And you can do that by going to getroman.com. So just walk, because these swipes are a clinically proven way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and fast acting. You know it's discreet. It's going to come in on a mark package. So you don't got to worry about your roommate grabbing it or whoever seeing it. And uh, they're easy to use. Just take the swipe out of the packet, swipe it on, let it dry. You're good to go. That's it. Like I said, it's GetRoma.com. So just walk. You can get your first month of swipes for just $5 when you choose a monthly plan. 
That's GetRoman.com slash walk. Go get your Roman swipes. I bet you Rita Hayworth wishes that Howard Hughes had Roman swipes. Totally. Totally. She's wherever she is. Mm-hmm. R.I.P. R.I.P. Yeah. Get a swipe. Get a swipe. All right, let's hop back into it. And then, you know, I was doing that in the in the hotel as well. And then he, you know, what else they have a lot of in Las, in Las Vegas and Nevada, and I guess in southern parts, uh, some parts of Southern California too, is Mormons. Okay. So somehow, some way, he has like his closest advisors are all seem to be Mormons. So they get the nickname, the Mormon Mafia. And they're really kind of running his operations for him because his, you know, they have a, they, not necessarily power of attorney, but they have, they're, they're running shit while he's on the eighth floor of the Desert Inn watching movies on his own personal Netflix station. And that is where the, this guy, Robert Mayhew, who we talked about from before, um, the Robert Kennedy issue, like he really comes into into play. So if you go to Robert Mayhew's Wikipedia page, it says he's an American businessman and lawyer who worked for the FBI and the CIA as a, as a chief executive uh, of Nevada operations for the industrialist Howard Hughes. So like that's like that is the big link so howard hughes had government contracts he had a lot lot of his own government things and then he had all this tremendous wealth and robert mayhew was the guy kind of running point and directing things for the hughes organization uh basically under the cover of hughes and it's not really known how much howard hughes knew or was involved with uh the cia at at this point because he was so drugged out and, and and mental at this point but robert mayhew certainly did Okay, so there's been declassified documents where it's like Robert Mayhew was working with Johnny Rosselli. You ever heard that name? Big, big time Chicago mafia boss. Sam Traficante, big time Florida mafia boss. I'm trying to. I got the other ones written down here. Um, but like anybody, uh, and Sam Giancana, which another Chicago mafia boss, Kennedy era. So he had relations with all those. There's declassified documents linking him with them and linking him uh, with plots to use them in assassination attempts against Castro. Uh, and then they had uh, another like crazy, crazy story that it was like the last thing that Howard Hughes's name was ever on was a CIA project called Project Azorian, which they had this. Uh, the Soviet Union, this is in 1968 is when this started. They set out, they had one of their nuclear subs go on a mission or on the North, like North Pacific Ocean, like middle of nowhere. And they had these nuclear missiles that could launch and reach 700 miles. So if you're, if we were going to go like have a nuclear war, they'd sail this thing from Russia, park it off the coast of Seattle or California, whoosh, nuke us. Okay. So. After a couple, they, the, that sub misses two uh, radio communications. So then the Soviets are like, oh, fuck. We have to go find this sub. They can't find it. So the United States is like, they're monitoring, you know, the Russian fleet in the Pacific. I'm like, what are these guys doing? And then it came to, to pass that they, were, that they were looking for this sub. And the United States, like, through their own CIA contacts, like, like hey, they're looking for this sub. Like, we should try to find it. So we had this special technology that could pick up, like, radar and sound waves from the bottom of the ocean that they that the russians didn't have so we found it before they did the united states found this nuclear sub the armed like so then nixon president now nixon's the president he green lights a cia um mission to basically it was like build a boat with like the vending machine claw game attached and pick up that sub and bring it so we can like study it and recover it and do all this stuff. Like huge product cost $350 million back then when we were still on the gold standard. So a lot of money. So how, what was the cover for this mission? Howard Hughes, Howard Hughes decides he's going to do some fucking mining operation in the middle of the ocean. That was the cover story. So they, they see I, and he just lends his name to it. Doesn't really have any involvement after that, but it's like, yeah, you can use my name. And so they use his name, and it's like the the Hughes Glomar boat, which is this giant ship that has a crane attached to it that will go down to the bottom of the ocean, which is it was the middle of fucking nowhere, sixteen hundred miles north of Hawaii. So like, and if you look at a, a map, there's just nothing there. They find it, they find the boat, and they're able to recover like a couple of the torpedoes and stuff like that. They couldn't actually get it back. 
but then Howard Hughes dies in 76 and no one had really heard from him basically since he was like, yeah, I'm doing this fucking fact finding mission, this mining mission in the middle of the Pacific ocean. But it was just, that was a Robert Mayhew thing. So Mayhew was like the guy. And then he is, he had, he wrote a book and his book was called next to Hughes behind the power tragic and the tragic downfall of Howard Hughes by his closest advisor. So he wrote that book and then he died uh, in 2008 at the age of 90 um, and the official cause of death was heart failure but people are saying like maybe that was like he was starting to talk and maybe that might have been a hit because he was involved in different mission and different stuff with the CIA all the way up until like that book wow. in 92 so um, and again like they said in 75 he had so like Howard Hughes dies in 76 and he gave testimony in 75 that he was involved in another assassination plot against Castro uh, where, he th where he was trying to get the United States to go to war with Cuba. And he goes, I think it would have been a just war. So, like, he was, you know, we talked about in previous episodes, like, false flags. Robert Mayhew was, let, like, the ground floor of all of this shit with the Cold War, the CIA, the Kennedys, Castro, this and that. A lot of it kind of always seems to come back to this like mysterious figure, this Robert Mayhew, yeah. and it's and it's crazy. So somehow he along the way in '55 he gets linked up with Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes loses his fucking mind. Who's the next in command? It's Robert Mayhew, and he's using uh, Howard Hughes's old connections and then making his own. And he's just like a key figure for or a key asset for the CIA and, and the uh, uh, the FBI. Yeah, I mean that guy. Probably has, like you said, he's got a lot of fucking shit to tell too. Have DiCaprio do a movie on yeah, that guy? Exactly. So I mean, I, I already want after hearing. I want a redo uh, on the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on I HBO mean, I gotta on demand it, right but now. Like, I want to redo it, like how they shot it. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. Like it's almost like it'd be better. At, like there's so much there. Yeah. That it's almost like you can't tell it in one single movie. It's yeah, like you like need a like a ten part HBO yeah. series. Yeah. I'm reading here too, he ate the same the same thing for dinner. He had a New York strip, cooked medium rare, a dinner salad, and peas, but he only ate the smaller ones, pushing the larger ones aside. I mean, bizarre. <laughs> what, how different different size peas? Yeah. Okay, so that's what I mean. Like, how, they're all basically the same size, aren't they? Not. I I, I would think so, right? Yeah. That, that's always been the way I've seen it. Yep. Um, for breakfast, he ate wanted his eggs cooked the same way that his family cooked it, Lily, and uh, like that's I don't know. But I mean, I you know the chronic pain. Yeah, that's a motherfucker, dude. Like, dude, I, I, if I have if I do like uh, rollerblading and play hockey and have blisters, and I, like I'm not joking, like I don't do anything in the next two weeks. Yeah, so I'm like I'm just miserable walking around. My feet hurt. Like I just don't do it. I can't imagine having these burns and head trauma, yeah. and neck pain, and all this stuff for years, thirty yeah. years. It's like Stephen King. You ever hear his story? No, it's that he was walking or running or biking or something in Maine. He got hit by a van and like, never knew severely that. like injured his back to the point where like he couldn't sit for a long like he was just never comfortable and like you know he's a writer like you yeah gotta be able to like lock in and shit right and uh like he was fucked up for a while i believe he never heard that yeah and like and then in the end i, I mean you know i don't know the story in between i don't know if he was ever became addicted to anything or whatever but okay. i know in the end he bought the van back and he would like he bought the van that hit him, <laughs> and he, like, would just fucking, like, hit it with a bat and, like, take out anger on it. That is, I mean, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Better than better than the guy who hit him, probably. Yeah, right? Yeah. So. Um, but, yeah, just, but my point being is just imagining a, such being, you know, yeah. chronic pain. I know. Brutal. That's why you got to, like. Take care. Take care of your health. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like, because it's just like you don't want to have these lingering things that just impact the rest of your life to the point that you can't. You're the richest man in the world, and you're lose your mind because you're on drugs and you're miserable. So like you just you gotta keep gotta keep keep it up. Yeah, man, stay this healthy. Is, uh, it's a fascinating yeah, he historical really is. figure. Yeah. Is that all we got? Uh, that's all yeah, I got. I, I need I need like and there's and still I, more. And I've like. I've done like a lot, like try to do a lot of research on this Robert Mayhew guy. There's just not, not a, ton. a ton out there, which tinfoil yeah. is like maybe they've kind of whitewashed a lot there. of stuff there. Yeah, like nothing's really been leaked. And I feel like that's a name. I had never heard of it before last week's episode, 
where it's like even if you are doing like a Freedom of Information Act search, there's probably not a lot of people in history like digging around for Robert Mayhew stuff. No, you know, because he's kind not. of like an anonymous guy aside from that book. Yeah. Damn, dude, this is uh, this was definitely more fascinating than what I thought we were in for when we started this podcast. <laughs> well, I'm glad I could honest. deliver. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, but like you know, it's yeah. I I blame the movie lar- by large I, part. I think that's fair. Yeah, you know. Yep. And yeah, uh, he's just a plain guy. Right. He's way more than just a plain guy. And to be honest, it's a shame he was so into planes because to be the how like what just, just make movies and bang start like come on dude. yeah well i think well he was doing both of those concurrently and then he did have so he had he won the oscar and then he got like well now i'm the fucking guy and he had like a series of flops over like mm-hmm. several years where he kind of lost his credibility and then he got some of it back with that capone style movie um uh, but it was never like you know, like you hear about like Warner Brothers and you know, all these big production studios from these big producers when they first went out there and like basically founded Hollywood. And at, at a time, he was like viewed in the same breath as them and then fell off. So like he like the he made more money, made most of his money from the, his dad's drill bit. And then um, he made more money from aviation than yeah. he did from from wow. Hollywood. But he. Yeah. You know, one thing, too, lastly, and this is, doesn't have much to do with him, but I'm always perpetually, I'm, I don't know if amused is the right word, but, like, surprised that these, like, one- or two-seater planes, like, haven't don't seem to have much advancement from the outside. You from the I old mean? school yeah, ones? Like yeah, like, when you see them, it's like, dude, those things look Especially, like, the prop planes, too, because they still have those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and I'm talking yeah. not the, like, the ones with, like, I'm talking like the straight up one or two seaters. Yeah, no, I know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, they're just like the same I thing. Like, Dude, man, would you? Do you think you'd be able to go on one of those? I, I would like to. Yeah, yeah, I would like to do that. I mean, who am I? I did the fucking McAfee Ultra really flying, so I don't know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you know, what I mean? that's way. Well, more I've than... seen that, and then I saw another thing recently that was basically like a kite with like a a bike, you know, like a mm-hmm. like a bike chain on it. Yeah, and I I would actually really like to try that. And just kind of cruise around up, you know, six, seven hundred feet in the air and just kind of whoosh around. That'd be uh, fucking hang gliding, dude. I've done that. Have you? Uh, well, I think it's actually uh, the thing I did was paragliding. And like, it's not that it was in Switzerland and it's not like it. I didn't. It was scary while you're doing it, but I was attached to a guy. You had to like run down this hill <laughs> and then jump off the side of a mountain. And like, so you're up in the Swiss Alps. And yeah, it sounds pretty scary. Yeah, right? so like you're, and you have to like time your jump, and it's like a three legged race with the guy who who's like you're attached to, and then you jump, and then like once you're in the air, it was awesome, but like when you're running down the hill, be like, I have to just run and jump off the side of this fucking cliff, <laughs> cliff. Like that was scary, but like once you're in, then he's like doing these different tricks and whatever. It was uh, that was awesome. Like I think I would be. I'm like I'm not really afraid of that kind of shit. Yeah. Like what I, about a hot air balloon? I've done a hot air balloon. Have you? I was in second grade, but I did. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they came to our school. Like, remember, I think it's, what's a real estate company? Remax or whatever that is? Yeah. So they had like a contest where they like brought out the field day and you had to uh, like, I think you like, they drew your name or something. And, and then, you won? I won. Yeah. So I got. How mad was everybody else? Oh, people were mad. <laughs> yeah, people were mad. It was like me and some, some girl. Her name was April. I remember that. Uh, April. And shout out April. And um, <laughs> <My> text, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, hope April's doing well. And uh, and but yeah, like that's how you did. That's how we did like the recess portion of that. Uh, so like everybody was like running around or whatever. They're lining up because it was field day, and I'm just like, yeah, 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 you know, four hundred feet of the air or whatever Damn. it was. Yeah, that's that was a cool. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. The only thing with that is like it's small. And you don't have any control. Yeah. So, like, you have to have a guy. And uh, I'd rather, like, I think that thing, the bike, I'm going to look up what that is. And were you a big blunt guy? You talked about blunts before, no? Yeah, I've never really been in one, though. Like, a hot Well, there's blunt. not many left, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Maybe I, I got the wrong guy. Man. Maybe. I someone I know is, like, a big, one of my old teachers is a big blimp guy. I don't think anyone has ever described me as a, quote, big blimp guy. So, <laughs> probably not me. I would I would like to go up into one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. Yeah. Um, Thank you. (laughs) No problem. That's all we have for today, everybody.
We'll see you tomorrow.